Today I'm joined by Loris Bertolacci. Loris' name has been mentioned twice already, once by David Jones and once by Anne Quinn. Loris is a fellow strength and conditioning coach with four decades of experience in strength and conditioning, working with Olympic sports and professional sports. Welcome, Loris. Oh, thank you very much for the opportunity to chat with you, Christian. Yeah, that's fantastic. Cool. Loris, mm -hmm. considering you've been around for four decades, how was life mm -hmm. before we realized that all you need for strength and conditioning is core stability <laughs> and the ability to activate your TA? And on top of that, <laughs> that every athlete is somehow deficient in that area. How was life before that? Yeah, before we didn't have any glutes and we couldn't fire our glutes. Yeah, you wonder how people went to the toilet, eh? Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I suppose I've gone, I've been pretty lucky because I've gone through all the phases where I was just a maniac in the gym myself as an athlete. And then obviously I, I lifted heavy weights. I was a hammer thrower and then I went that way. And then I actually did get sort of, I suppose, sucked into the whole Pilates core stability thing, the Paul Check thing in the, in the late 90s. So, you know, my head's got scrambled a little bit and um, I went too far down that path, but that only lasted about two years before I realised I was uh, making some big mistakes. But, um, yeah, it's a bit crazy now, isn't it? Um, and uh, and, and that, 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 that whole area's got its place, but it's more for rehabilitation, to be honest. Um, and... and um, And I think there's quite a, a dichotomy or a, a misinterpretation of, of what it means, say, when you're t training a young athlete, a young boy, you know, doing an arabesque. It's just a, it's an exercise. It could be a squat, couldn't it? You know, you're not, you're not activating TA. So people sort of get really mixed up, I think, in terms of um, very light exercise versus, versus TA. But I, I, look, I have to say that I did work in the Pilates area. I did do... Um, I am a bit of a geek, and at one point I was doing um, ultrasounds on the transverse abdominis, and I think in very extreme rehab situations, there's a real uh, validity in that whole area, right? But, I mean, you can't go around the, the, the athletics track holding the TA with your fingers down your pants, you know, it just sort of gets a bit messy sometimes. So. <laughs> yeah. How did you get into strength and conditioning? Well, that's, it's, it's interesting. I actually sort of remember that at school, when I was at school and I was doing sport, and I'd be playing football or I was in the last year of my schooling. I, I, I just seemed to be organizing groups and, and, and helping people. And, and that just, I, I look back and I remember that. And then as an athlete in my athletics club, uh, I was a hammer thrower, shot putter. Um, uh, and I was at university. I was doing science, uh, a, a whole range of science subjects. Um, and uh, my, 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 my cousin, Rudy Villani, who's a really famous ex exercise physiologist and, and fantastic athlete, you know, we, we used to talk a lot together. And, and um, I used to write programs at that, in those days in the athletics club. So it was just a normal athletics club uh, in Melbourne, a suburban club. So I was always writing programs, helping people, showing them how to do Olympic lifts or whatever. And then... Uh, And then I went to Italy to train in the late 70s. I was sort of lucky to be involved in that whole era when the Russians were there and I learned a lot. I came back and I was sort of teaching people all the time. So, so that was a start. But I wasn't doing formal uh, uh, strength and conditioning course. I, I was at university. I was, I, was, I was actually an eternal dropout. I just dropped out about three courses. I did science. And I, 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 um, I actually did start with physical education. I left that. I went back to science. And I did a whole range of science subjects. But my initial sort of, um, which was really good, because when you do science, to be honest, that's the background of what, you know, we need to do. I, it's, it's better than doing physical education because, you know, I learned physics and chemistry and biochemistry and all that sort of stuff. But, but you know, my, my true grounding was at the athletics track in the gym with the athletes and then helping people. And that, that progressed. Um, I went to the Australian Institute of Sport for a year. Uh, I came back. Um, uh, I retired from sport. And then I became uh, a sprint coach in 1983. Uh, and I was actually training sprinters and jumpers. And, and, and significantly, you know, I still hadn't really got formally into strength and conditioning in terms of what, you know, you do and what I do now. Um, that, um, 
I, uh, you know, I, I was actually um, uh, working in gyms. That was, that was a critical part. To, to, to earn some money from about 1984, 1985, um, I, I just got work in, uh, after a failed business venture, but I, <laughs> I got work in, uh, in the fitness industry. I got work in gyms, managing council gymnasiums. And that was really important. I think that um, I, I look back on that era and then a few things that happened to me personally and working in gyms and working with the public, um, but also working with young kids and, and stuff like that taught me uh, the value of hard work, taught me the value of uh, listening to people, talking to people, writing out programs and, and customer service, I suppose, you know, which is pretty important in, in coaching, really. You know, we tend to sort of forget that. And, uh, and then um, I, I, the cleaner at Fork Mill Leisure Centre, which is a, you know, a real sort of out in the Bronx of Melbourne, the cleaner told me there was a job at Essendon Football Club. So I went for it and, uh, and I got the job. And, and very quickly, I, 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 I want to tell this story because I think it resonates these days with, career choices i finally landed a good job as a gym manager you know they had a whole lot of sexy girls there in the gym and i was getting good money and i thought wow this is a great job you know i was married and um and uh <laughs> i got this job at essendon part-time essendon football club was the first year of afl you know it was about six thousand dollars a year for four nights a week after work so i went to the manager of the gym and i said look john you know can you uh, can you change my shift so i can do the job at essendon because it'd be great for you you know you'll get a lot of exposure i'll be the cool dude here <laughs> and of course i didn't have my degree yet uh, there and uh, he goes uh, no sorry you know it's either here or essendon you know so i resigned from a council job and to actually uh, facilitate myself being able to work at Essendon. Um, I worked and work, uh, worked at uh, a place called the Peter McCallum Hospital, which is a cancer hospital in Melbourne, um, as an orderly in, during the day so I could work at Essendon until I got another job. So that's how keen I was to get into the industry, and that's, that's 1987. That's a different era. You know, I, I think that's important because uh, you know, that was, uh, I, I nailed that job, and then I didn't have my degree yet. And that I, I had, I think five years later, I went back to university, finished that, then did my grad, dip, started my master's. So I sort of finished everything in my late thirties. So that was sort of a, it's a very quick trajectory through a few years for you. <laughs> yeah, I believe it's very important because even nowadays, a lot of my colleagues, including myself, I think we started at a fairly low level, just because we wanted to make our passion into a profession. So. Exactly. Yeah. It's worth, worth mentioning that uh, in the 80s or 2000s, it's still the same. Well, well I think the other, and the other thing too, it, it, was a, it was a definite decision that I, I, I had to juggle because I had a family, I had kids just, just born and I had finally got a good job and I didn't have any money and I had a job at the council and it was a beautiful job. Uh, but I sort of knew that I was entering into the AFL just when it was starting And I thought, this is my big opportunity. And I'm just going to, for $6,000, I'm going to give up a really good job and supplement my income because this is the brand I want to get for where I want to be later. So that, that I think, resonates these days. So I think that's an important thing. You know, I mean, you've got to be careful. You don't want to sacrifice your family. But that's, that was, that was, a, that was a, a very real decision and, you know, I had to make. It was a fork in the road. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> As an S&C coach, what was your darkest moment? Oh, absolutely the darkest ever was 2006 in April uh, when I was uh, sacked as the uh, high performance coordinator, strength and conditioning coach for Geelong Football Club. Simple as that. And it, look, it, it's pretty well known now. There's enough people within the inner sanctum and even outside the sanctum that, that uh, it was a personal thing. There was, was a personality situation there. But I was a year and a half into a very good contract and, um, and, uh, It's April, it was about round three, and uh, I immediately got on my high horse and went to the lawyers, and uh, which took a year, and I, I litigated, I litigated twice, went through a defamation case, but, uh, and, and it was harrowing because Melbourne is the hub of football. People even now are talking more about football than COVID-19, right? And uh, it was almost like, you know, It was around me all, all the day, you know, every day, you know, and I had to sort of find work 
very quickly because I didn't have a lot of money. So I had to actually very, 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 very much a situation now. I actually was stuck because I'd actually had to find money. I had to pay lawyers. I had to downsize. But also it was just getting, you know, smashed by the trolls on the, on the, wet, on the internet even then already, you know, idiots saying things, you know, and people making up gossip and, and then your brand being squashed and then, it was harrowing for six months. It, it was it was extremely stressful. I probably didn't cope that well with it, and uh, it wasn't great for my family. And and then obviously I got out of it, um, and um, I litigated. You know that was all successful, but um, it, it was also a dark moment because I'd actually joined that club in 1998. It was 2006, and I mean you're not aware of football, but Geelong had recruited the basis of their super team in the late nineties, early two thousand. So I'd spent six to seven years with a group of 18 year olds. And then just when they were coming good and they were already okay, uh, you know, I was terminated. And so there was a whole range of reasons that it was extremely dark. And, and then, um, and then obviously I couldn't get a job after that. Mm. (laughs) I couldn't find work, you know, (laughs) And is yeah. it some from what I've just heard between the lines, was it also some kind of character assassination following all that things? Uh, look, the moment I, I sort of live with that, that's okay. I have no problems uh, with the football club now. In fact, you know, um, absolutely none, even with the CEO that's still there, because they, they, they're a corporate identity. They've got to protect their brand, right? And Obviously, it, look, a year later, you know, at the end of the day, everybody's going to remember, you know, uh, David Beckham or Gary Ablett Jr., you know. Um, they're not going to remember the strength and conditioning guy. The, the supporters don't really care, right? So if you go and they're reasonably successful after, I mean, you're just, you know, you're totally dispensable as much as you don't think you are at the time. And I think a lot of strength and conditioning people forget that. I, I, I knew that pretty well. I, I'd always said I was in, uh, dispensable, not indispensable, dispensable. But, um, but, but I think, yes, so to protect themselves, because I litigated to protect themselves, you know, there was a fair bit of, they were trying to justify the reasons to the media. And then um, there was quite a battle going on legally. Oh, look, the other thing is that, and, and I'll probably mention it later. Um, the other thing is that because, and I think it's the same in Europe, you know, supporters are just mad. You know, they're just, that's all they think about, right? So that when you walk around Melbourne, it's just like footy. I mean, footy is more important than the universe, you know, in Melbourne. So, so you're just copping it from everywhere in society. So everybody recognises you for that period of time too. And uh, so... It's it's quite um, and it was it, because I um, yeah because I litigated that made that was damned if you do and damned if you don't because I litigated which then meant it was you know it was a fight you know? so I don't know whether it was a good thing to do now or it wasn't a good thing but um, but yeah but look it was fine you know like now it's fine it's all good history has, has sort of I suppose somewhat vindicated me and um, you know what doesn't kill you makes you stronger and all those things are, are very real. And, and, and obviously out of that grew a lot of other opportunities and learning experiences, which I would never would have had, you know, I would have become, I was starting to become a bit of a footy head, you know? So, so that's, um, so the, the, a lot of positives out of the negative. <laughs> yeah. What was your best moment? Well, it's funny. Uh, it's, it's going to sound strange because obviously I was with football clubs when they won premierships and I've been involved with very successful athletes and trained them, you know, but I think aligned with what we were just talking about was that when I actually uh, had to earn money very quickly, which is going to happen to a lot of people in this situation now that's occurring in the world. And I didn't have much money and I was living um, I was training a lot of kids. 12, 13, 14, in the park, just to make some money. Yeah. And, um, and I was still, still pretty negative about everything. I was quite cynical, negative. You know, I had a lot of um, uh, issues, I suppose, with, 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 with the ongoing saga. Uh, but 
I'm a bit of a joker myself, you know, I'm sort of known to be a bit silly sometimes. And, uh, you know, when kids were around, I'd sort of make sure that I worked hard because I've got a good, I had a good work ethic, I thought, you know, from, from the back. And I looked after the kids and, and I tried my hardest and, I, 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 um, and, 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 you know, made sure I was nice to the parents and tried to listen. And then one day there was a, a session where I helped a kid. He couldn't do anything and I sort of stuck with it and he was crying and I helped him and we were all laughing at the end. And the realisation came to me that these kids just appreciated you for who you were, for how you were going to help them and, you know, maybe how good you are and how you look after them and how much empathy you've got for them. They didn't care about footy like the old people, like the parents, you know. They didn't care about the sagas and the... The, you know, they weren't, you know, they didn't have um, preconceived notions, you know. They just said, oh, well, here comes Lawrence. He's a good guy. I'm going to have a bit of fun. And that was a big aha moment for me and, and, and an enormous um, change in my, my mindset at the time on how I approached everything. And look, it's not quite strength and conditioning, but it is because I was training. And, and it, that's, that's really true. That, 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 that was an important, and it was actually one night that I actually got in my car and I went, okay, these kids, these kids, these kids like me. They don't, they don't have any, they just like me for what I, what I do. They, they tell the dad, dad, I want to go back to Loris because that's what the business, business is that, isn't it? You know, it's not, the kid says, I don't want to go back to that place, but well, you're not going to go back. So there you go. A bit lateral, but that's, that was one of my nice moments. <laughs> How has it influenced the rest of your coaching career? Well, I, I think that in that situation, but also uh, going back as an athlete, um, I'd had a lot of issues. I'd been a successful athlete. I'd won a national championship. Um, I'd worked very hard, but I'd also not finished my degree. I hadn't finished my, um, my professional life. And I, I'd sort of just... I dropped out of university and all I did was train for athletics. And then, and then I had a few issues personally with a sort of a, well, I was a hammer thrower who had an eating disorder, worked that one out. You know, I always wanted to have abs. I wanted to have abs as a hammer thrower. Well, that's impossible because I've got to eat. <laughs> and um, so in the end, you know, everything got to me at about 27. You know, I didn't have a job. I didn't have a, a wife. I hadn't worked. And then I had a real downer for about two years. Came out of that and that was fine. So that combined with the situation in, in Geelong and then having to be, um, you know, just, it was, it's humbling, you know, just going out in the park and training kids. It was humbling. You know, I'd been on the ground in front of 100,000 people. I was the guru, you know, I was the man. Uh, that was extremely humbling. So when you look at the way I coach athletes, but it was also before because of other experiences, I, I think I've always had a little bit of, quite a fair bit of empathy for the athlete more than the administration or that, you know, I sort of, I'm an athlete coach, centered coach. And, uh, I'd listen to the athlete. Um, I'd try and work out if, if, if do, you, do you know how I, I always didn't like when football coach go, he's soft. And I go, well, mate, uh, I'd like to meet you 20 years ago. I could probably take you into the market in Iraq and you'd probably shit yourself. You know, uh, I don't think you're that tough coach. You know, And um, so, you know, I sort of understood the frailty of human beings. We're, you know, we're, pretty, we're pretty sensitive, frail people, you know, and we have issues. And, 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 and so, therefore, I think a lot of the things that happened to me as an athlete and then, you know, sort of uh, as a, have helped me coach. Now, the flip side is, is sometimes I've got too much empathy. You know, I think sometimes, you know, you've got to, you've got to go hard, you know, but sometimes I'm a little, I think I'm just, I'm a 1% soft man but I, I think those things made me understand people with issues and problems and then be able to work through them um, because I mean that's the art of coaching you know otherwise you can't get by in you know, in your, you, you know you. And, and I was a great believer that if I've got 100 athletes I want 99 to be successful you know I don't want just two to be successful mm. which is what a lot of other coaches do you know they just smash people and they, you know, law, law, the law of survival yeah so there you go mm. <laughs> If you could travel back in time, what advice would you give a younger Loris? Finish your degree, you big idiot, when I was young, you know. I think that um, a, a, an absolutely critical part of uh, advice I gave somebody, Adam Basil. Now, Adam is uh, 
now working in the Victorian sport. He was he went to the Olympics. He got the final for the four by hundred meters. He was the high performance director for Melbourne Victory in the A League, uh, St Kilda. Uh, worked at Melbourne Storm in the NRL, and very successful guy. But he was floundering. I was helping him a lot when he was a young guy at eighteen, nineteen. You know, he's he'd been a junior champion. He was all over the place. He was unemployed. You know. And um, he came to see me for some advice, plus I let him train at the football club. So it's exactly the same advice that I gave him, I would give to me. I said, okay, Adam, come in. I said, the first thing I want you to do is get a job. He goes, oh, I can't, I've got, to, I've got to train full time. I go, mate, get a job. I don't care what you do, get a job. I don't care what it is, as long as it's not digging ditches, you know. And then when you finish work at five, go and train. You'll be fine. You'll have $700 in the bank a week. You'll be able to go with your girlfriend to dinner. You'll still be able to train. You've still got five hours to train. So um, then from there, he got a job and then he did his certificate three. Then he did his massage qualification. And then he went to university part-time, actually when my daughter did. And he got his degree. And it was all those things I put in place for him. Because I knew that in our societies, generally speaking, not always, right? And if you don't get your life fixed up and organised, you, 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 there's going to be a tipping point at some point when, you know, when, when things go bad, right? And that's probably what I did wrong. More so probably for my athletic career, you know? Um, that was, that's what hurt me at 26, 27 Probably as a strength and conditioning coach, to be honest, it might have helped me because it's the sum of my experiences of how I deal with people now, which is probably gives me more scope to understand, you know, the holistic approach to coaching. Not, you know, you know. Was not having a degree um, the factor why you didn't get any job at some point? Oh, no, 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 no. I've got a degree now. In 1990, Essendon Football Club played um, against Collingwood in a very famous grand final, the 1990 grand final. Okay. You don't know anything about footy, but it's pretty famous. And, um, and uh, we lost. We should have won. We lost, right? So then, in, anyway, the board, this is 1990, said they did an inquiry yeah, or football, a review. Every club does a review. Right? And um, they found out I didn't have my degree. Right? That's 1990. So I went back to university at 35. I was married. I finished that. Then I started my, I did my postgraduate diploma. I started my master's, but I didn't finish that. But, you know, I got myself fully qualified. Now I'm fully accredited as an ESSA high performance sports scientist. You know. But yeah, no, 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 not later, not later. That was fine. That was, that was more in 2006 to about 2010. That was more my brand was just squashed. But the other thing too wasn't just my brand because, you know, when you get sacked and you send a CV to Holland or to the UK, they just go on Google and they go, oh, the guy got sacked somewhere. He might be a good guy, but we better not take a risk with him. I sort of understand that. They don't know me. They're not sure. They're not sure of the circumstances. They've got to. And the other thing was my age. When I, when I was sacked, I was already 52. And that I didn't quite understand. That I took me a few years. That The industry was building up. There was a big groundswell of very good people coming through, very competitive environment. And I sort of got swamped a bit too. So sort of a little, there was a multiple factors, but I was fully qualified and fully accredited, you know, um, with, S, with everything. Yeah, yeah. So that was more a brand situation and a, and a, um, a multitude of factors. And, and I think age to some extent. Yeah. 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 What advice would you give young aspiring SNC coaches? Yeah, that's a tough one these days, and I think it's more pertinent now than uh, than uh, than ever, really, because obviously, well, before that, before you even get into university, make sure you really want to do it. Don't just think you're going into it because you can be Loris Bertolacci with Essendon Football Club in front of a hundred thousand people, because good chance you won't get there, you know. That, that's just a statistical reality, right? Um, that, so you need to make sure that you've got, or somebody needs to advise these kids that they've got the right reasons to do that, right? 
to do the degrees and the masters. I, I think there needs to be a tip. There, I think we've, we've reached a bit of a sort of a tipping point there. But, but then once you've got into the system and, you know, you want to get work, then you have to multi-skill these days and it's going to be more important now. Right? Um, so I think you have to take the sports science hat off and the strength and conditioning hat off. And the way I'm thinking as of yesterday and today is that the fitness industry is going to provide a lot of avenues for young S&C staff now coming through. Right? And fantastic learning ground, plus you can make some money. You know? um, and I, I think that you have to be very patient. I, I don't like telling young strength and conditioning people that you've got to work for nothing for five years. I don't think that's a nice thing to say. I mean, it's sometimes a reality. And obviously, I think because of the situation in the world right now, clubs are probably going to use interns a bit more. You know? um, but I, I think you have to be extremely patient. I think you have to find work just outside the pure S&C field but close enough that the moment you get an opportunity, you know, you can work 30 hours in a gym and eight hours with the soccer club down the road and then hopefully that's 10 hours and 20 hours and then, you know, you can, you can but you've got the ability and, and the, uh, to work in other areas and that, that could be like 10 hours as a pool attendant, 10 hours in the gym and five hours doing GPS. It's fine. And the other one that I think is really important, I actually said this to um, somebody the other day, is that, um, you know, keep your eye on your goal. That's okay. You've got an end goal that could come sooner or later. But uh, I think personal training will become bigger with young kids. I think that will become a big industry. And it's not glamorous for young graduates, you know, to go on the soccer field or, to bring a TRX out and to bring some dumbbells. Man, you know, you, it's great. It's great work. It's what you've got to do. You earn some money, you learn. And um, so you, I think you need to multi-skill, uh, but you want to stay fairly close to the industry so that, you know, your CV is always growing. And then obviously um, keep ticking away at your CV. That CV has got to grow all the time. So you've got to work out how to do that. Uh, that's that's the quantum difference now, and then seize your opportunities. Now, uh, one of my friends is in Houston now, working in the MLS. He was working in a factory. He was doing his degree in exercise science. I was mentoring him. I was sort of facilitated uh, an internship at Melbourne City for him in the A League, which meant he had to work for nothing, and. Uh, I said to Adam, he said, oh, I'm playing soccer, I'm working, I'm earning money. They're going to, I have to work, you know. And I said, Adam, please, you finally got an opportunity. Just grab it and just don't muck it up. You know? So that's the other thing. The moment you, you will, It's like a footballer, you know, the coach puts you on the ground, you've got five minutes to go and you've got one opportunity in your life. You know, well, just grab it, you know. Because, you know, this, and you've probably had people yourself come into the gym and you've probably made a decision pretty quick because that guy's lazy. You know? But if, oh, I like that guy. That guy's really working hard. You know? So you, you've got to really, nail, you've got to nail it, you know, when you do get an opportunity. That might take three years. So. Yeah, so a multitude of things. But I think multi-skilling in future is going to become really important, really important, multi-skilling. And, 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 work, and, and the fitness industry, I think, is I think there's a I don't know what happens in Europe, but here in Australia we have certificate three, which you know the local plumber can go and do certificate three and get his first aid, and he can work in a gym. Well, I think there needs to be a change there because um, I, I really dislike that. You know, um, even though I'd say I started in a way, but that's okay. You know, um, I think um, it, there's got to be room for graduates, and it's such a big industry. Uh, the, the, the fitness industry, I think that's that's where you know thousands and thousands of people can start and then move into clubs because <laughs> yeah, I would like uh, to dig yeah uh, yeah go for it sorry okay <laughs> I would like to dig into that multi skilling. Could you outline a few skills? I mean, multi skilling is a bit abstract. What are the skills? Oh, okay, yeah. Well, actually. You're right, and I think multi-skilling is everything from doing a variety of jobs 
to actually what you do um, in terms of uh, your athletic activity. Right? Now, I think it's, it's just, just what I mean by multi-skilling is that a, you need to apply for a job. If you can't get work and you, you're a graduate, okay, uh, uh, you need to knock on the door. What, because I've mentioned the fitness centres, I'll keep going in that area. You need to knock on the door of a, of a council gymnasium and say, look, I'll work in the pool. I'll be a pool attendant. Plus, I'll help in the gym for you. Right? Um, because the moment you've done that and you've got some hours in the gym, you're, you're on the way. You're ready to go. So that, that, that's one part of multi-skilling, which people and a lot of strength and conditioning graduates say, I don't want to do that. I don't want to work with old people or, you know, sort of some accountant who's 150 kilos, you know. Um, so I, 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 then, look, it could be anything. I, I think that personal training um, is, is really important and that's, that's multi-skilling because a lot of people don't do that, to be honest. You know, they sort of, they all want to go towards the inner sanctum. You know, they want to be interns in the AFL or NRL or Premier League, you know. Um, so I'll buy multi-skilling probably, yeah, it is a bit of a nebulous word. I'll probably mean just get out into the community straight away and offer your services at the lowest level. So even if it's the under-13 women's netball team and you're helping them warm up, that's a critical part of um, your development, okay? Well, it's the extremely important part of your development when you've got the FIFA warm-ups and they're not, they're not being utilised, for instance, you know. So I could go on forever like that because I think that there's a great lack of um, knowledge within universities of how to... So one, one of the things that I would like to do if I actually had control would be of a university. So you've got the FIFA 11. What else have you got? You've got in Holland, I think, there's a new volleyball warm-up, I think, you know. Um, okay, let's teach these young kids how to do these warm-ups and get them into local football clubs and and get these young graduates to just work and show the warm-up. Oh, what seventy-five percent might be able to do it. The other aspect of multi-skilling is probably the wrong word. Is that one of the pieces of advice that I always gave um, my staff within AFL clubs, especially the young ones? I said, look, if you've got a chance, right? Uh, I'd like you to do Olympic weightlifting and go and do a level one course and learn how to do Olympic weights. Um, I, I funny enough, from your first question, go and do a Pilates level one course. They're looking at me going, Pilates? Olympic weightlifting? Is this guy crazy? Right? And go to the athletics track and get a good coach. And I want you to do all three at the same time. And they would say to me, what? I go, well... If you know how to Olympic, lift Olympic weights, you can do anything afterwards. One arm dumbbell rose, trap bar, one arm kettlebell snatch, Turkish get up. Once you know how to do Olympic weights, I don't care what anybody says, you can do everything right, in the gym. Number two, learn how to sprint. Learn how to run. It's going to help you a lot. <laughs> if you kind of be involved in soccer and football and you know whatever. So go to, a, go to the track and, and run. like Compete. Compete for a year. Join the club. Get, you know, just join the group. Start running 300s and do high knees and, and go and do Pilates because what it is is Pilates is just fine-tuned. It's just like, you know, everything's like learning that, you know, external rotation, where the shoulder sits, the humeral head sits, blah, blah, blah. That's important. You know? So you, you're going – and so, you know, you're not, you're not just a muscle head at Westside Barbell. Huh? You're not some, you know – person in the Pilates studio just doing dead bugs on the Pilates reformer. You know. You've sort of like got all three areas covered and then they can all join in. And, 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 and I, I, I can honestly say that a lot of people took my advice and did it. No, I could mention names. I could name names. And um, that was just something that I suppose – I'd done in my career in, 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 in the 90s especially where I was training people and we were just lifting massive weights, footballers, you know, just massive, right? And I was successful. I, was, I had too many injuries. I had too many injuries. I was getting too many injuries. And um, 
and then I sort of went the Paul Check way and the Pilates way, you know, and all what you mentioned at the start, you know, I was investigating everything. It sort of worked, you know, but the, the athletes were crap, you know. <laughs> they couldn't do anything, you know. <laughs> so, so then uh, I realised that, you know, my philosophy had to change and I became very holistic in my approach and, and my philosophy uh, became totally holistic. So, in other words, um, do anything that the athlete needs. So just grab from anywhere in the current research and the athlete needs that. And that's how I sort of started developing or mentoring from probably uh, 99. I sort of changed my mentoring, you know, and, um, and I think a lot of the people that, that I've mentored since, you know, I've actually given them that insight to sort of be extremely holistic and never sit in a brand or don't, you know, I say to them, I don't want, I don't want to hear you becoming sort of a, you know, you know a, a brand, you know, because then, then, then you can't deal with any, you know, you basically got to be able to problem solve anything with an athlete. So, so that, that was sort of some of the advice that, um, and the directions I gave young people. Yeah. Hmm. Let's switch gears and go from young aspiring SNC coaches to thriving SNC coaches. SNC coaches, hmm. you see, there's a trend after 15, 20 years that coaches transition out. Uh, they become performance managers, they become lecturers. Mm -hmm. What made you stay motivated and continue as an SNC coach for so many years? Yeah, I think that's a big fallacy, and I think that's just going to change in the future. I think I think the industry will uh, will will realize that that just went too quickly. So first of all necessity i had to work right um but th the buzz i get is uh like one of the sports that i've been heavily involved with since 2006 is tennis and uh and luckily i've actually trained a lot of players you know on the atp wta circuit you know that are quite good and so then i had to learn a bit about tennis because i didn't understand really what the requirements were you know so sort of how do I blend in the specificity and the, the change of direction and the footwork and the shoulder needs? How strong do they have to be? Do they really have to be that strong? You know, whatever, you know. And, and, and so I had to learn a new skill set in, in terms of uh, tennis and, 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 and I just scoured everybody. I just pinched things from Jez Green and from Mark Kovacs and, you know, just read things and, trial things with the athletes. So I love that. And then you see improvement and then you see, uh, then you see, uh, you see a result. I think the problem now has been, there's been this sort of massive, I, 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 for the life of me, why are they calling people sports scientists? I, I have no concept of what's going on in the industry. And you've got to realize that's only recent. I mean, we're talking like 1995 since 2000 it's not like since 1762 right? i understand research research is critical so that's a sports scientist or researcher that's a different thing i think research and people researching whatever you know a fascicle or ta or whatever that's fine that's a researcher that's a completely thing we need that research because ultimately that all will link in 20 years time you know? but um but Yeah, the, the whole notion of having these different titans for people. What do you do? You just do you just tell people how to lift, and you never look at the the velocity on the bar, or do you never take an RPE? Of course, you're a sports scientist too, and you you use that knowledge. You know, you use the sports science. So I think that, um, and then 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 the evolution of the high performance manager, which is just a, an extremely recent phenomenon. We're talking like. 10 years that's happened right and, and people are going to question that now right throughout the whole industry and sadly because of what's happened in society you know because they're just going to be going well we haven't quite gotten as much money and this guy all this guy does is go to meetings and talk it's just we just talk all day we just talk and talk and talk you know and that's all we ever do right And I think, you know, there's a limit to uh, 
you know the administrative sort of functions that people like that have to do. Just get a se- just get sorry, just get a secretary. You know, <laughs> if you have to do that, um, so yeah, the, you have to manage. There is a, there is a you know you have to do budgets. You have to hire and fire staff. You have to uh, buy equipment. You have to go to meetings and ask doctors or tell doctors. You have to know how to set up a database. You know, and, and integrate it into meetings and have all the systems going throughout the club. You know? But I still think there's time for those people to get in the gym and show a person how to do a power clean or, you know, activate their glutes or do a high knees or something like that, you know. And, um, and, and significantly, and I think there's going to be a trend towards this back, is that whenever I develop my staff, I never let them become, so, yeah, never let them work in silos and I never let them have a title. So I would get... So if you came to me in an AFL club at 24, I would put you in the gym a bit. I'd put you on the track a bit. I'd give you a hamstring injury. I'd make you do some, you know, lactates. I'd just give you a nice, broad experience. You know? um, and, and a lot of the guys that, that I've known that are doing quite well now, or started with me, sorry, they've had that nice, broad experience. And I think it's holding good stead. So I, I think there's... Um, I think the industry is very recent. It's very new. And I think that um, I think we're going to see it sort of level out a little bit. And, 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 and the, the admin are going to start questioning the, the, the hype of sports science and gurus. You know. like, yeah. But, uh, yeah, so. Yeah. Talking about <laughs> hiring and firing, you have been involved in hiring processes of SNC coaches or assistant SNC coaches? What are the qualities you're looking for? Yeah, that's a great question, isn't it? Uh, look, the first thing is that obviously uh, is, is, is passion. I, I, I mean, to be tr- truthful, when I was in the AFL and probably not now so much, but more so in the AFL, well, There's two stages. When I was in the AFL, I, I did have a bit of an idea how I wanted to set up my staff. Okay, so I did have a sort of preconceived plan. And generally, I like to have, you know, a bit of experience, a bit old, a bit of young, you know, a bit of sort of ambitious, a bit of experience and sort of somewhere in between too, you know. So I like to have a bit of a balance and then you know, somebody with a personality too, somebody, you know. So I sort of tried to... I, I realise that you, you need to have a nice blend in your stuff. But having said that, um, a really good story probably to illustrate that is a guy called Christopher Dennis. Now, Chris, um, unfortunately, has got caught in the whole AFL um, shutdown and he's, he's uh, not working at this stage the last two weeks. But he, he, Chris started with me in, in 2002. Just flipping forward, he was... At Geelong Football Club to 2005, he was with the Queensland Reds for two years. He was with Leinster. He then was the high performance manager for Le Stade Paris. And he's back doing the strength and conditioning with Geelong. So a highly successful guy at 39 or 40. But Chris uh, was pestering me, um, sending me emails and ringing me up. You know, and I'm from Ballarat, which is just outside Melbourne. I've got a double degree in, in, in physical education or sports science and something else. I've been working with the under 18 system. Can I come and help you? you know, the, you've had these and I'm just, uh, you know. anyway, third time he came into the, he came into my office and he's a really well built guy. You know, he was really well dressed and, uh, and he'll laugh. If he listens to this, he'll laugh. He had this really nice professional looking bag with him. I'll never forget that. And, uh, And Chris came in and uh, he was really, he just listened, you know, he didn't say anything. He just listened to me, you know? And I said, so, you know, who are you? Blah, 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 blah. And he answered the questions. Okay, fine. You've been a basketballer. You've worked in football. Um, I said, okay, Chris, you can come in the mornings on Wednesday mornings. We have a weight, a weight session uh, every Wednesday morning at six o'clock. I want you here. Uh, we're not going to pay you. Uh, we'll do that for the year. If you miss a session, I'm not going to use you anymore. And he never missed a session. Um, he did his job. He showed up. He's, he gradually, as I got to know him, you know, his personality shone through. 
and uh, he just worked his butt off and he was confident, which is probably 70% of it, you know, oh, 60% of it, sorry. But it was that ability to sort of seize an opportunity and grab it and I just went, wow. Now, obviously, he was impressive. He was good, you know, he knew what he was doing. But he, 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 seized, he seized the opportunity and grabbed it with open hands and... And I could see, I could sense that straight away. So it was probably the, the knowledge. Ultimately, you know, I've had other people seize the opportunity and they're just not as good. That's fine, you know. But I still respect them and if they have a go. It's funny though, um, there's a girl I know, I won't mention her name, who was not in an AFL club, same thing. She seized the opportunity, she struggled, she really hadn't done a lot of strength and conditioning. And but she she was she was good, you know. She 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 was always there to help me. So I gave her a lot of GPS work and stuff like that, you know. And um, this girl now, like five years later, is doing really well, you know. So I think that's the trait you want to see that they, 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 they've got the work ethic, they've got the passion, they're punctual, um, and they don't mouth off, you know. They don't they don't they're not they're not full of themselves, you know, because. You just get. You just don't want to see that, you know. Unless they're funny, that's different. If you've got a personality, that's different. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what is your coaching philosophy? Uh, oh, look, I think I've sort of touched on it before, and it's changed a lot. Uh, certainly, in terms of uh, the sports I was involved, I came out of hammer throwing, and I. I, I actually trained in 1977 and 78. I twice went to Italy to train as a hammer thrower. And I actually, and this is the truth, I actually sat in rooms with Bondachuk and Peter Sheeny in Italy and listened to the periodization models over bottles of wine. I don't drink, but they were drinking. And uh, the Italians used to bring them into Italy and they used to get them pissed. And then they used to try and milk all their ideas, all the Russians and the Germans. It was pretty funny, actually. Um, so I actually went, oh, my God, this is unbelievable. This, this is like history. You know, I was actually seeing history. You know? Can you imagine that? You know, Peter Sheeney, you know, Bondachuk, other guys. You know? um, so I came back to Australia and I was a power freak. You know, three weeks on, one week off, periodization models, jumping over hurdles, you know, everything, you know, rotational work, um, hopping. Everybody's, in 1978, I'm hopping, I'm bounding, I'm doing plyometrics, I'm doing altitude jumps, I'm doing everything. Like, And then when I got the job with AFL, um, I, 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 I sort of did the same thing. You know, I just sort of went, bang, you know, got to get these guys strong, got to get these guys super powerful, you know, got to get them fast, you know. And then, as I said to you, you know, as, I, as that worked, that actually worked, right? There's no doubts it worked, but there was a bit of collateral damage. <laughs> There's a little bit. Some people couldn't cope, right? So um, you're thinking, oh, geez, you know. He's, he's, he's injured. <laughs> um, so then I went through the whole Pilates thing, core stability, transverse abdominis, glute firing. So, so basically what happened was, and, and, and it was probably the, the light bulb went on in about 99, was that, and I was pretty, I was fully qualified. I was very scientific because I have scientific background. You know, I'm, I am a geek. I had computers from 1988. Um, I read widely. You know, um, in terms of research, you know, and uh, I just went, ah, oh, you just use everything. I, oh, I haven't got a facil- I haven't got a philosophy. I just got this guy here. So this guy here just walked in the footy club. He's 18. He's 98 kilos. He's just done an overhead squat with 80 kilos, and he's never lifted a weight in his life. This guy here, he's come from a private school. He's actually can't do a chin up. He's hanging from the bar. And this guy here has had 16 injuries since he's 16 and 17 and doesn't look like he's going to be a man till he's 23. So all of a sudden, I can't do the same program with these guys. This has to be totally different, completely different. Right? Ultimately, blending into, they've got to be strong, they've got to be powerful, they've got to be able to do bounding. Ultimately, the end model is fairly similar, but the development phase, which lasts till about 22, 23. 
so basically then all my experiences came to the fore and 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 it was more like okay um this guy just needs to do you know low level work for the next year until we're ready to go uh this guy just can't run he just can't, this guy can't run you know so we just need to spend a lot of time working through a whole lot of issues and getting his range of motion right, getting his legs strong, teaching them the drills, but then that's not just this one thing. You know? So basically I just learned, my philosophy is to use anything and everything that's out in research and sports science and strength and conditioning and all tools to achieve the best possible outcome for the individual athlete. Sorry, I haven't got some magic exercise, you know. So I'm happy to use a trap bar. I'm happy to use a dumbbell. I'm happy to use a kettlebell. And um, I don't really care anymore, you know. Um, I still love my Olympic lifting. I still think it's gold, you know, because all that sort of stuff. And ultimately, I want people... We, we, we all know in the... It's, you know, n- n- not so much, you know, swimming and cycling and rowing, but we all know... To some extent, it's still true. But we all know in running sports and, and team sports that, you know, ultimately if you can't jump and bound, you might as well retire if you're 32. It's over, it's over you know, you're finished, right? You can't, you can't absorb force anymore. You can't take the eccentric force. So, so that's the end result. You know what the end result is. You know, you've got to produce force. You've got to accept force. But, um, but you know, before that, you know, how do you get there? Well, whatever, just use whatever, you know. And um, so that, that's that's probably a snapshot of my philosophy. Yeah. yeah. What are your core values? Oh, my core values in terms of coaching. Yeah. yeah. Uh, look, I, I I think that um, it was interesting that um, there's a lot of people um, doing a lot of introspection at this stage of you know history of the world <laughs> as we're talking on april the 6th and it was interesting on facebook a couple of footballers were talking about me in the past right? and um some funny incidents that happened when i was in football so these are the ex-professional footballers like they're 40 you know and um and so one of the things that i used to like to do with um, professional footballers was make sure that they enjoyed what they did. Um, and then the other thing, it's probably not a core value, but it was probably an approach that I took was that it took me a while, but I learned to be myself. Now, sometimes it's a bit hard for people to take, but whatever that is, and I, that's, that's, that's something I've always said to strength and conditioning coaches. Don't try and be something you're not. You, you know, if you're a quiet guy, you're a quiet guy. That's fine. It's okay. All right. Just be yourself. I'm Lyra, so I'm a bit of a joker and, you know, a bit of a bit zany and all that sort of stuff. So be yourself. Um, my core value in terms of coaching, you know, is that, you know, uh, that I, have, I, 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 want, I want to have empathy with what, what the athlete's going through. I want to understand what the athlete is going through. Um, so that's... Um, really important and, and 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 another core value which i taught a lot of strength and conditioning staff and i learned this probably more so working in gyms i thought that was a really good experience working with the public for a number of years was um and I, I, i'm going to swear now but hopefully you don't mind this is you know it was called star fuckers right um so you used to get interns come in right so so if it was like a 17 year old soccer player or footballer And then he was in the gym and David Beckham was at the other side of the gym, right? So if the young footballer called the intern because he didn't know how to do a power clean, said, oh, can you come over here to show me how to do you know, a power clean? I came in the office and said, can you show the, if I saw the intern going, yeah, yeah, I'll be there later. It's all right. I'll be there later. But then you'd see David Beckham walking, you know, or Gary Ablett Jr. in Australia. And he'd say, oh, can you shout? Hey, no, I'm out there, out the door, you know, straight away, right? And I think, okay, I don't like that guy. I don't like that kid. So I'd grab the kid and I'd say, the intern, and I'd say, listen, from future, you give that 17-year-old unknown player who's a rookie and not even on the playing list, but see here training, 
not 100, but 99.9% that you're going to give David Beckham or Gary Ablett Jr. Because if I see you doing that again, you're out of here, son. Right? So that was an important core value. And that, that for me, was inbred in me and, and I think um, to, 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 to really you know, help everybody in the gym. And I didn't care if they were a champion or not. Now, realistically, I'd still give 0.05% more time and thought to the champion because that's your bread and butter. Right? <laughs> but in a team sport, the players see that. The players see that in a team sport. If, you, if you're helping everybody and you're not just gravitating towards the stars, the players in teams are very smart. You know, they like to see that. They like somebody that does that. So that was an important core value. And, and then oh, the, other, the other core value I have is resilience, I think, for me, is that, you know, I'm just a human being and I have negative moments and, and, and you know, dark moments. And I, 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 um, I, I still get scared before I go into a session in front of people. It's still like the butterflies are still there. And... Um, you know, it's just sort of believing in myself, having that sort of, uh, just slipping into that, you know, the two devils are fighting each other and, and having that faith in, in, in that, that I can actually um, help an athlete or, you know, and therefore help the team. So, so yeah, there's some of the core values. Yeah. Which is the person that has influenced you most and why? Oh, it's tough. That's tough because I've just been around so long and so many coaches. But I think my father, to be honest, and now that you say that, because dad, dad um, is an interesting guy. You probably can Google him because I've put some pictures on the net, Giorgio Bertolacci. Dad was a really good athlete in, um, in Italy before he came to Australia in 1950. So he played rugby union, water polo, Greco-Roman wrestling, represented Tuscany and shot put and discus. And then he came to Australia. He was nearly the first Italian guy to ever play BFL football. Um, and he represented Victoria in shot put and discus. He was working on the wharf. He was a tug of war guy. So that, but then when, when, you know, when, when I became, he, he first introduced me to shot put. He coached me for shot put. And I was instantly successful. And then um, at 13, and then he started coaching down the athletics club. So dad had no, very smart bloke. He'd been to university but in Italy, but not, you know, uh, not finished because of the war. Uh, and massive sporting background, huge, you know. And uh, massive guy, you would have loved him. You know, at one point he was 150 kilos, you know. And uh, he was just huge. He was massive. And um, he, uh, he started coaching at the athletics club. And it's interesting, his method, you know, and in terms of his success, he coached juniors right up to 20, 12. And he probably had like 50 Victorian champions, 30 Australian champions, he, you know, that, that became. And, and you, your average sports scientist and strength and conditioning guy would probably laugh at him, his methods now. Right? So basically all he did was he trained on, all the kids knew that he trained on Tuesday, Thursday night at the athletics club. He'd open the gate, Tuesday, Thursday night, he was there. Uh, Sunday morning in winter, that was it. Tuesday, Thursday, Sunday morning, right? And I saw guys at 16 benching 150 kilos. You know, reps of five, reps of three, reps of two, uh, three sprints, two overhead shot, five jumps. It was like all, it was like the, the the ultimate minimum effective dose theory, right? And all these kids are just going, well, this is just, this exploded. But he also had a lot of fun with them and, you know, joked with them and, 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 and you know, drove them home and all that sort of stuff. And incredible success at that junior level. But his actually method was pretty good because it was minimum effective dose, but it was all good work. It was all quality. And um, I even outsmarted myself 21, 22, where, you know, It's my dad. I just said, oh, shit, dad, that's no good, you know. But looking back, you know, it was a fantastic way to train kids. And, um, and yeah, I, I suppose I remember at his funeral, my, my cousin spoke. and My cousin was a superstar athlete and we trained together. And um, he just said, you know, George inbred the love of sport in me. You know, I mean, I, I, 
I had that experience with sport, but I also had that experience seeing him coach. So obviously that was probably the greatest um, um, uh, effect because, because I've had a million coaches. I've worked with some of the greatest AFL coaches. I, 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 I sat on the grass at Tivenia in, in, in near Pisa with, with Sheeny and some other guy and they're talking about periodization models that, you know, astounded the world. And I'm sitting on the grass and they're talking about it in 1978, you know. But, yeah, so I've had all these myriad number of coaches and people, influences. But, yeah, pivotally, that was what really, it's really stuck in my mind, how Dad, and, you know, some of these guys threw 60 metres. Hmm. You know, that, that, that was serious throwers. That, 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 they could throw. <laughs> they could throw, right? Um, and some of the guys that he coached became super AFL players later. So it was, it was very interesting. It was, it was just quality over quantity and, um, and enjoyable. Quality over quantity and enjoyable coaching method. There you go. <laughs> How does a typical day in the life of an SNC coach look like? Now? Yeah. In China? Yes. Or in the AFL or in work? Anything. Totally different. Every, every, anything. I've, I've written uh, down... Uh, as an add-on to that question, you've worked in Olympic sports as well as in professional sports. So what's the difference as an SNC coach in the uh, way you work? No, no, there's no difference. That's a, it's a good question. There's no difference. I think preparation is the key. Now, whether you do that preparation at night, whether the worst possible thing is to go into a session and wing it, obviously. You know, that's just the absolute... You know, once in a blue moon... And actually, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's an add-on to that story or that add-on to that statement. But preparation in the day of a strength and conditioning coach or the night before, which is part of the day, um, it's, 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 it's actually having a plan. Um, it's documenting everything, having it, you know, especially at the professional level, to be honest, whether it's training an Olympic athlete or... Um, or, uh, or uh, especially when you've got some numbers too of people. Uh, it's just, it's, it's so much preparation. So, so, so I think the day begins with, you know, um, basically working out what every athlete needs, um, writing, write, documenting that at all times, being fully prepared. Uh, the next thing is part of that process before that session is making sure plan B is ready just in case things happen. So you've got a, a sort of a plan B either written down or, or you've actually thought of it. So for me, off, often, especially even in here, because I had language barriers in China, it, 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 you know, it, it was like three to four hours of making sure all my programs were set up on my computer and my iPad. And I had everything written. And, and then obviously to myself, justifying what I'm doing, you know, in terms of uh, evidence base, you know, so the programs got some validity. Um, But, but the other thing too is, especially when you're working with groups and teams, is that working out how this, how this session's going to work. How's it going to gel? You know, I mean, I'm, it's probably with an Olympic athlete, if you're one-on-one -on -one with the same ball, you probably can just wing it because you're doing six sleds and six sprints afterwards, right? But when you're working with multiple athletes, um, You know, you've got to actually work out how that hour is going to work, how it's going to look and where am I going to fall into traps. So, again, that's preparation and timetabling. So a lot of the time is spent, you know, as we spoke before about high-performance managers, that's different. I think they just get into coaches' meetings too much and just talk too much these days and it's just like that. But the preparation phase in terms of strength and conditioning is a critical one. Right now, as you get more and more experience, and you would have experienced this too, you still prepare. I still prepare. I, I, will, I, I, I absolutely hate going into a session without being ready. Right? Um, but um, what happens when uh, what happened to me down in Kunming a couple of times because all the all the teams were in lockdown, so we only had one gym and we had a thousand athletes. Um, you know, the, the, the road cycling team would, would 
would take over the gym and nobody's timetabled this. And I've got 30 cyclists and we've got no equipment and I've got a minute to think of something. So that's the opposite. That's just experience ticking in. So you then, you've, the typical day of a strength and conditioning coach is get ready for that surprise because it's going to come. And, and that can happen too in a typical day of a strength and conditioning coach. As much as you've planned and you need to plan, as much as you've meticulously written down things, oh my God, I have to change everything and I've got one minute to think of something and I'm going to have to look really confident when I pull this off, right? And that, that does come with experience. That, 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 that takes, you're either an amazing 24-year-old or you've just been down that trap. You've, you know, you've just gone, ding, I remember that. And you just grab the dumbbells and you think of exercise. So I think having, you know, it's like saying, you know, um, don't ever go into battle without a plan, but plans are useless. And so the day of a strength and the conditioning coach is all that. It's just like planning meticulously, but then during the session is being ready. I mean, the other thing that's really interesting and I think that's really important that I learn a lot in terms of, working with professional athletes, even in the private environment, you know, and that was Olympic athletes and, 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 and obviously trying to earn a living and then working in football and even working here when I'm busy is you need to look after yourself. So the typical day of a strength and conditioning coach is look, unless, um, uh, unless you're just somebody who can live off five hours, I can't, I can't, I need my eight hours, you know, so, or seven hours minimum, right? So you've got to look after yourself and you've got to actually be like an athlete. So a strength and conditioning coach has to think, oh, I'm an athlete, right? So when am I going to eat? So my blood sugar level's right, so I'm thinking, so I don't get angry, you know, am I, am I, am I rested, you know? And, and, um, and, and then obviously, um, so that's important, I think, in, in this typical days is, is actually looking after yourself, how you eat, when, you know, and I'm sure you've done it too, you know, you've got multiple sessions. So you think, well, I might have half my lunch here and half my lunch there so I can actually feel good. And I might have a 10 minute power nap so that I'm ready to go when I hit the athletes, you know? So the last thing you want to be is in front of athletes going, oh, yes, right. So you've always got to make sure that you're rested or, you know, or, you, you know, because it's very hard to hide that, you know, sometimes you can. But uh, so that, that's really important is, is funnily enough. That's probably a bit of a lateral one, you know. And, uh, and then it depends who you are, really, I suppose. You know, I mean, obviously, at my age, I've had to work out different ways of coaching and putting the message across, which involves, you know, computers and iPads and vision because I can't do plyometrics anymore. You know, I can't do things, you know, so... So getting all your, um, these days, I think somebody like my father could still coach in an athletics club because it's sort of like small, small groups, sees them every day, you know, consistency. But in terms of our world and the professional environments, I think there's such an evolution with vision and, 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 you know, the tools you can use, you're still coaching. But you've got some fantastic stuff you can do. So, I, you know, getting vision prepared. So, really, when you say that, you know, I think preparation and, uh, and, and making sure, you know, you've um, washed your face and you've got clean clothes on and you're ready to go, you know, in front of the athletes. And that's, that's a really important part of it, yeah. <laughs> How do you design a training program? Wow. Um, probably the worst person to ask that. Uh, well, first of all, I simply, depending on what sport it is and depending on what phase we're in, I simply look at what the team needs and what the athlete needs. So that's the first thing. So I don't think about, I don't have any preconceived notion of what I'm going to do for an athlete or a team. So first of all, so the best example is 1993. I remember a chap called Vern McMillan came to see me and he just got the job at the Kangaroos AFL team. And Vern's become really famous in golf now. I think he owns about 15 boats. He made the smart choice when he went to golf. Um, you'll probably have a laugh if he listens to this. 
And he came to see me, and, he, and I was working at Essendon, so we were in rival clubs, but those days, he was a mate. Right? And he said, uh, how do you periodise the, uh, how do you periodise the, the season? I go, oh, I don't periodise it. I said, we start training in November, they have a break at Christmas. They have two weeks off. Then we have, they come back in January, then they start playing games in February, then the season starts in March. So, we do a truckload of work in you know, January. So I said, I just react to the time frame working backwards and then fill it in. I don't follow traditional periodization anymore. And he just went, wow. It was like, seems simple now. But I said, I've got, I've got this much time. I'll just work it out. You know? And then that's the, that's the, the big picture. You know? uh, then obviously the team, if it's a team, as in a soccer team or football team, which is a little bit different to a cycling team like I'm working with now. Um, you know, the coach will tell you what they want. So that's the next thing because the coach says, I want to do this much. You know, and you go, oh, that's a little bit too much. He goes, no, no, yeah, I want to do this much skill. Okay. He wants to do this much skill. Okay. So we've got that, which is fine. right? So once you've ascertained generally what the team in general once, then you, then, you, then you go back to the athletes. So then we're starting to get into the nitty gritty of the programs. And going back to my philosophy, uh, how do you design a program? Well, obviously, if I've got a 19-year-old uh, team sport player, especially in football and rugby and those things, and they're you know, 78 kilos and they need to put on 20 kilos, right? I'll, I'll, I'll design a hypertrophy program for 18 months for them. Quite obviously, I, I went to Pilates. <laughs> because they've got to put some meat on before they can get strong, right? Um, whereas the guy that walks in at 97 kilos, well, he actually retired at 97 kilos 10 years later. Right? So I'll, I'll, I'll design a very different program. So straight away, it'll be, you know, a little bit more like jumping and still some weights and totally different program for him. And then, um, then somebody who's always getting injured, well, we've got to get him strong, but we've also got to get him rehab, so... It could be a totally different program again. Now, I don't have the luxury of doing that now in my current job because I've got two, I've actually got 60 athletes, two teams. I've got um, a track endurance road cycling team and a uh, track endurance team, sorry, um, track endurance and a road cycling team, junior. So the, the, the road cycling teams are juniors. They're under 18, bar two or three athletes, so 30 of them. And then the track endurance team, there's 30 of those. So uh, I, I set up a template on Excel. I try to individualize it all for them with the track endurance team as much as I can. The more I get to know them, I design the program. So basically with them, um, they hadn't lifted a lot of weights. A lot of them are 23, 22, 21, but they hadn't done enough. They hadn't done some proper weights. So I still had to go through. I, I actually used Dr. Yeses. Have you ever heard of Dr. Yeses? Yep. Yeah, I used his program for four weeks, 20 exercises, only three or four weeks. And I made sure they learned all these exercises and they got some conditioning. And then I just sort of did supersets. And then when that was done, all that sort of blah, blah stuff was done. Uh, I started a proper strength program and, you know, they're starting to get strong now. And that's just the classical program, prehab and then squats and stuff like that. With the juniors, you know, I have to react to the situation. They've only got them two to three times a week. There's 30 of them. I've only got them for an hour and a half and the equipment, there's not enough equipment in this joint. So I just have to design that around them. So I have to do circuits. I have to, I have to develop something that will work, but still get some conditioning into them. So it's a fairly broad sort of situation. Now, if I've got a one-on-one -on -one athlete, like a tennis player that I'm helping, I'm going to help a few players around the circuit right now online. Um, that's totally different. You know, I'll ring them up. How do you feel? My shoulder's sore. Okay, don't do bench press. Don't do push-ups. Do that. Um, uh, what did you do yesterday? Okay, what are we going to do tomorrow? Show me your plan. Okay, tomorrow we're doing speed. I'll, I'll send him the speed program. Uh, tomorrow, the next day we're doing leg weights. We're doing power weights. You know? um, so yeah, it just depends what you hit with and what you need to sort of uh, solve, I suppose, and, 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 and uh, assist with. Yeah. Hmm. Do you want to nominate someone to be interviewed? 
<laughs> I sound like a family man, actually, um, now. Well, well, she's not really Australian anymore, to be honest. It's my daughter. Um, Lauren left Australia in 2005. And she did her exercise science degree. She was already in the Australian team for volleyball. She played in five countries in Europe. Uh, represented Australia 120 times. Trailblazer in volleyball. Uh, part of her contract in 2013 with the Swiss team, Lucerne, was to coach the men's team in second division. She got them up to first division as she was playing too. When they went to first division, they said, look, if you retire, you'll be the full-time coach. So she coached the men's team in first division, which is pretty crazy. Right? And then she was only like 30, 31. And she, did, she started her master's in East Cowan, but she didn't finish it. She started, she's got her grad dip in, in East Cowan. And now she, last year at Newcatel, um, she won the pre-season cup, the in-season cup, the league. She won everything. And they were heading to win everything this year again when the season was cancelled. So Lauren's got this fantastic background in strength and conditioning. She did the strength and conditioning for the men's team. Uh, she's a superstar volleyball player. Uh, she's a trailblazer in coaching and she's still only 33 or 34. So I hate to say, uh, I hate to stick to my family, my father and my daughter, but um, it's not too broad. But um, I think that she doesn't get the recognition in Australia that she deserves. Um, and yet, you know, she's highly respected already in the world of volleyball as a player and now a coach. Um, yeah, so there you go. I'm on that, Lauren. <laughs> that, that sounds really interesting. Looking forward to it. Where can people find you? Oh, look, I, I, I'm extremely active on social media. Um, in fact, I probably spent half my day at 65 years of age, go figure. Uh, um, so, uh, I like, I'm very careful what I write, uh, but on LinkedIn, you can find me. I spent large years, it's pretty easy. There's not many lots, but large years around and, um, on Instagram and Twitter. Um, I have a bit of a problem with Facebook because, uh, or social media, because when I put something funny, everybody likes it. When I put something serious and theoretical, nobody seems to be interested, but anyway, maybe that's part of my character. Um, but now I, I do get a fair bit of, uh, interest and, and, and LinkedIn is um, pretty pretty serious approach to that and I, I, I do I do post a fair bit on, on LinkedIn to be honest um, just in terms of the professional side of things you know yeah, yeah. so I'm easy to find on all those platforms yeah I will link it all up fantastic <laughs> yeah Loris thanks so much for your time despite all the difficulties yeah. we had with the technology sorting it out And thanks for sharing your expertise and experience over four decades. Oh, fantastic. Thanks for having me. It sort of made me really think about things too and uh, sort of prioritize what I had to say and not talk too much. I probably did. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much. Thanks, Loris. 